I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. And you know, it's all about the neighborhood. This is a conversation about how we build our community, our neighborhood, house by house, family by family. We're focusing on business creation, business development, economic development, and culture. This question uh, is about home ownership, wealth creation. How do we increase home ownership? While the foreclosure epidemic devastated the black community, there are some bright developments on the horizon, such as light rail. So how do you use development and strategy and policy to increase home ownership and wealth creation in the black community in ways that addresses the problem we just went through. Betsy Hodges. Well, home ownership is one of the key ways we're going to have to stabilize our communities. We can do that in three key ways. Making sure to invest in the programs that we know work to create home ownership for folks. Working on alternative ways of funding home ownership for people. And making sure that at the city we are fully funding our affordable housing trust fund and our heading home Hennepin plan to end homelessness. Investment means programs like Minneapolis Advantage or City Living that have helped people get through this foreclosure crisis by providing assistance for mortgages and assistance for down payments on home. Alternatives include things like community land trusts, where you may not have the same amount of equity in your home that you would if you bought it outright, but it is your home. And then we work on the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. I worked with Commissioner Gail Dorfman. I was at the county when she was working with Gary Cunningham, my husband, to create the Affordable Housing Incentive Fund. And I learned there how important that is to, to create affordable housing throughout the entire city, and in, in the county's case, the county. I have worked very hard to maintain that funding in our Affordable Housing Trust Fund at the city since I got to the city, and I've worked in partnership to make that happen. I sat on the executive committee of Heading Home Hennepin to make sure that those strategies that we have to create that housing and get people into that housing were followed and done well in partnership. I will continue that work as mayor. Thank you. Don Samuels. Yeah, one of the solutions for the challenges of the north side community is uh, stable housing. The people form a neighborhood and neighborhoods are strong and resilient. And uh, that's why I uh, became a member of the Twin Cities Community Land Bank. I'm on that board uh, where we uh, uh, get the right of first refusal uh, from the banks on certain properties that are going into, uh, have gone into foreclosure and we, uh, we get a 40% discount and we sell them to developers uh, of our choice who do good home ownership development so that they can um, sell those houses to homeowners at uh, a, a reasonable rate. And uh, that's the kind of project we need to continue to do to help people with down payment assistance, et cetera. And then we also need to uh, emphasize education. That's why I'm glad a program like the Northside Achievement Zone exists, as my wife Sandra runs, because there's an intimate relationship with families so that when families are going into uh, taking the big step of going into home ownership, they don't get into trouble later. And, and foreclose again because the scammers are coming after them and the equity they gained. So we need, uh, we need to support programs like Urban Homeworks and Project for Pride in Living and others who are doing that kind of uh, counseling work so that families don't go through a cycle of ownership and loss, ownership and loss, but we stabilize and strengthen our communities. Thank you. Thank you. Well, what we do know is that we're not doing enough. Think about the triple whammy that North Minneapolis has experienced with the mortgage crisis and getting ripped off by the banks, with the tornadoes, and with the um, foreclosures that have happened in the community. The community has been placed in a completely untenable situation. It's not enough to fall back on the same bromides that we've used to talk about getting home ownership. Today, 
in the city of Minneapolis, we have an economic development agency that's going into North Minneapolis and willy-nilly knocking down beautiful old 100-year-old houses that ought to be preserved. There's not a smart policy currently underway. What we need to do is coordinate our housing development with an investment strategy, with a transit strategy that will make housing less expensive and transit less expensive, and a job development strategy that's focused on North Minneapolis that works for everyone. Homeownership is the dream of most families and unfortunately out of the reach of most of families right now. We need to fix that. The quality, and we, but we can say that the quality housing on the north side is one of our greatest assets. We need to match those two together. Tran we know that transit makes housing more valuable. We know that transit is an amenity that really increases our property values and increases employment opportunities. There's nobody else up here other than Councilmember Samuels, Samuels who knows what it's like to live in the middle of a neighborhood which is full of foreclosures. I've had, got a ton of vacant houses around me, they've been vacant, and there's no plan, there is no strategy. There is no plan or strategy at CPED to how to deal with this. As, as uh, Mark just said, it's a willy-nilly approach and it's not community-based. We need to fix that. Our strategy, we need to have a strategy to deal with the homeless. We need to support organizations like Build Wealth Minnesota. We need to support the work that the Polad Foundation and PPL are doing to increase home ownership. And we need to connect with communities. We don't need someone coming in and telling us what is a good idea and what they would like to do for us, we need to talk to the neighborhoods about what do you want to see happen to the houses on your block. And we need to engage with families who are looking for those opportunities in our neighborhoods. Thank you. Gary Schiff, how do we increase home ownership uh, with the foreclosure epidemic uh, that's devastated the black community? Uh, there still are some bright developments such as light rail on the horizon. How would you engage um, those opportunities to increase ownership and to ensure preservation of homes. Thanks, Al. First, we have to support our existing homeowners. When property taxes are used and raised again and again and again, it pushes people out of homes and into apartments. So the first thing is to keep property taxes low and stop treating homeowners like an ATM for the city of Minneapolis. <laughs> Number two, we have to encourage those who have housing to invest in it to keep up the quality of our neighborhoods. The city has gotten rid of so many valuable programs that we used to give grants that were forgivable after 10 years when you homesteaded your property. I will bring those successful programs back. Number three, the question was also about light rail. I believe in community development that brings revitalization without gentrification. And I have worked on light rail integration in my district to make sure that we didn't displace people from their neighborhoods, but that we used it to harness the energy and the capacity to raise everybody up. And that's what I'll do as mayor. Thank you. Cam Winton, uh, same question. How do we increase home ownership? Uh, how do we use developments like light rail? and others to increase home ownership and to ensure home preservation. Sure. Well, as has been said, the first thing is to preserve existing home ownership. I think it's important to note, though, one of the other candidates just mentioned that we need to stop treating property taxpayers as ATMs. I could not agree more, but I would ask people to remember that the person who just said that has been on the city council for 11 years and has approved all those budgets that treated you like an ATM. So please keep that in mind. Second thing, preserving existing home ownership. I would make sure, as mayor, that I'm using the bully pulpit of City Hall to reach mortgage modification agreements that are win-wins. Yes, for the bank that owns the mortgage, but also for that homeowner who's working really hard to pay as much as possible. I'd use the bully pulpit in that fashion. Secondly, I want to give credit where it's due. The Minneapolis Public Housing Agency has done remarkable work with a difficult situation. but. I'd use that bully pulpit to advocate for more Section 8 funds. Section 8, when done correctly, can be an incredible way to preserve people in their homes in our community. And finally, I would change the fact that currently a developer can get city money to build a property with some affordable housing units in it, even when only 20% of those units are affordable. They're getting our dollars, but only 20% of the units are affordable. That's not right. And when I'm mayor, that number will be much higher. 
Thank you, Cam. The next question uh, will start with Jackie Cherry Holmes. And what will you do to assure police accountability? What are your ideas to address the problem of guns and drugs? I was instrumental in creating the Civilian Review Authority. I was totally dismayed when it was dismantled. The fact of the matter is the statement that the police can uh, uh, police themselves is not realistic. We've done, been there, done that. We need to reinstitute the Civilian Review Authority in a strong way so that we ensure police accountability. As it relates to gangs and, and, and drugs, the fact of the matter is that gangs are a national, state, and a local problem. Um, we need to work with our community-based agencies. We need to work with our communities to address the issues. The fact of the matter is I think that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. We can do policing and we can do prosecution, but we need to focus our efforts on prevention. And that means working with our community-based institutions, supporting their efforts, ensuring that our young people have good opportunities both uh, in school and after school. We need to surround our young people with the support that they need to be successful. Thank you. Mark Andrew. <clears throat> Mark Andrew, what will you do to assure police accountability? What are your ideas to address the problems of guns and drugs? You know, the best strategy that we can have overall for demand on the police department and crime in the community is a job for our citizens. That's the number one thing we can do. With respect to the police department itself, I, like many others, am sickened by the TV reports I have seen over the years regarding police conduct, conduct against some of our citizens. I don't think this can be a situation policed internally. I believe that, this, that we need to reinstate the Civilian Review Authority. I agree with Jackie on that. I think it's an important thing to do. We need to create distance between how those cases are judged and investigated and evaluated without interference, any interference at all, and it needs to be done in a transparent way. With respect to guns and drugs, everything I've advocated regarding guns in our community has been ruled unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. I would have banned them years ago. Uh, with regard to drugs, I would take prosecutorial pressure off small crimes, and I would put stronger focus on repeat offenders and maybe reclassify some of those crimes. Don Samuels, uh, how, what will you do to assure police accountability? What are your ideas to address the problems of guns and drugs? Well, first let me say the Civilian Review Authority was not dismantled. As Jackie was saying, we have a brilliant head of the Civil Rights Department and she worked with the police chief, including the new police chief, Janae Harto, to say that instead of making decisions as civilians and sending it to the police department to make decisions about discipline, let them sit together and talk it out so that the incompatibilities get thrashed out at the table, rather than one decision being made and another decision being made independent of that. They're now working together and talking about what is it that you don't see in this? Tell me, because I see something. And we're going to have stronger results. The other thing was not working, and the community was frustrated. Okay, so now talking about guns, I just think that we are just too soft on this issue, and we need to be strong at the state. I am going to take the issue of guns to the state and make sure that we hold our state representatives and our national representatives accountable because they're getting away with being afraid of the NRA. And, the, and I will bring the voice of the citizens that everybody, 90% of the people, say that uh, they want sensible gun laws. Why are we playing with the lives of young African-American men in communities like North Minneapolis? Thank you. Betsy Hodges, what will you do to assure police accountability? What are your ideas to address the problems of guns and drugs? Guns and drugs are a symptom of a larger problem but it's a symptom that we have to deal with. Jobs are important, housing's important, stabilizing our community is important, but at the end of the day, we need to get guns off the street and drugs off the street. One of the ways that we can do that is through policing. Another way that we can do that is through support for our youth violence prevention program. 
And one way that I think we should consider doing that is working statewide and regionwide to question whether or not there should be sanctions for people coming into our city from other places to buy or sell guns or buy or sell drugs. <laughs> Police accountability is something that I have worked on for a long time. And right now, what needs to be done is to work with Chief Harto on her new training strategies and her new accountability strategies to change the culture within the police department, which I have faith she is very interested in doing, but also to see how the civilian oversight process that we have in place now is working and how we can strengthen it. The state decimated our ability to do independent review, and we need to figure out the best way possible to make it happen. Thank you. Cam Winton, what will you do to assure police accountability? What are your ideas to address the problems of guns and drugs? I agree with number, a number of the things that have been said about the importance of more jobs in enabling economic growth so that people can turn away from crime and have a paycheck. You've heard me talk about my ideas to streamline the process of creating new companies that will hire people and building existing companies that will hire people. So let me talk in more detail about cops and drugs. As long as we have more jobs, more cops will also be part of the solution when I'm mayor for bringing crime rates down. Right now we have 850 cops. If you look at the standard metric that's out there about how many cops there should be in a city of our size, it'll tell you we need about 975 cops who need to be well disciplined and well overseen. And when I'm mayor, we'll have that many well-disciplined, well-trained cops. Regarding the oversight process, I'm watching closely, but I'm willing to give new Chief Harteau time to implement the training program she's been doing. And on drugs, people who would peddle poison to our children, I will squash them like an insect. But to people who are addicted to drugs, I'll give them the compassion that they need to rid themselves of that addiction and turn back to a drug-free life. Thank you. Gary Schiff, what would you do to assure police accountability? What are your ideas to address the problems of guns and drugs? We have a great opportunity in the years ahead to change the face of the Minneapolis Police Department. 40% of the police department will be eligible to retire in the next decade. The next mayor of Minneapolis will oversee the recruiting, the training, the hiring of the next generation of police officers from the city of Minneapolis. I will make sure that we train and recruit from our neighborhoods so that we diversify the police department and get a police department that represents this community so that we see ourselves as part of the solution for safe streets. Number two, I will be a voice for reforming outdated drug laws. We have far better priorities than throwing another generation away in prison. And three, nothing stops a bullet like a job. I will make sure that our city contractors are hiring people who live in our neighborhoods and that by connecting people to the jobs we create, we fight poverty where it starts. Thank you. And so the last question, uh, before we open the questions up for the audience, uh, I'm actually putting two questions together, and I'm going to start with Don Samuels and work that way around uh, back to Mark Andrew. Uh, Don, uh, what distinguishes you from your competitors? Uh, so what are you saying that's different from the other people that are seeking this office? That's number one. Second part of the question is, what would you have done differently from the present mayor? Where has the present mayor not delivered that you will deliver differently to the citizens of Minneapolis and to the black community? 60 seconds. Well, in, in the, the sense that we are in a black church, let me say that I've been a part of the black church most of my life. I have volunteered and served in the black church most of my life. I breathe in and live the black experience in the Jordan neighborhood. I have three, two Af three African American daughters and an African American son and an African American wife. We are an African American family in an African American community, attending African American church, 
And, and so we have that unique experience. There's nothing special about it. It's just unique. And it's different from all of my, uh, my, my competitors. So I bring that sensibility to the, the, to the debate and the leadership of the city. And I will act out of that. You will see that reflected in the decisions I make because I ex observe things from a close up. My family and their relatives and my neighbors, their lives depend on it. The sense of urgency, it's not about policy for me, it's about my life and the life of my family and my community. 30 seconds, how do you differentiate yourself from the current mayor? What would you do differently from the current mayor of Minneapolis? Well, um, the current, you know, we all have uh, different strengths. I am going to be engaged with the people of this community in a way that no other mayor could. Not just RT, but nobody else up here could. I'm going to be on the street, available and accessible. You walk by my yard, you'll see the mayor standing in the doorway. I will, you can knock on my door, you can call my phone. I will be, you can see me at a vigil standing up there when somebody gets killed. You can see me on the street when there is a crisis because I'm intimate and viscerally involved with the problems of my neighbors. Thank you. Betsy Hodges, what distinguishes you from your competitors? And what would you have done differently, sort of two parts, uh, from the existing current mayor? Well, I'm a leader with experience running city government and running the city's budget. But I'm also somebody who knows how to build relationships to get things done. We learned through this recession that government alone is not sufficient to solve our problems in a time of declining resources. I know how to build relationships. I'm president of the League of Minnesota Cities. I'm the only opponent on the Stadium Implementation Committee. I know how to reach a hand over a gap, invite a hand back, and hold it when it comes. I also know how to take on a tough fight. I spent six years doing something really boring, which was reforming our closed pension funds, but it meant it saved you a $20 million pension bill on your tax levy in 2012, and then it becomes a little more interesting. I would distinguish myself from Mayor Ryback. Uh, I voted differently than he would have on the stadium, but now I'm working hard to make sure it happens. I voted differently than he would have on his police chief, but now I'm working with our current police chief to make sure things go well. But I have an opportunity he didn't have. I have, an, I have an opportunity of a city that's going into economic recovery rather than decline. And I have the leadership it'll take to get through. Thank you. I'd like to take Cam, a Cam, same question. I'd like to take a brief moment and congratulate Councilmember Hodges on that work that she just mentioned, reforming the pension system. That was tough work. She did it well. And while she and I certainly have disagreed on some things on that one, three thumbs up for Councilmember Hodges and her work on the pension reform. Now let me talk about how I'm different than some of the other candidates. As I've mentioned, I'm not coming from a background in government. I'm coming from a background in the private sector. My coworkers and I have built a business, and I'm proud of the fact that we've employed 120 people and sold the company to a bigger one recently in a way that preserved everybody's job and enabled everyone to share in the benefits of the sale. Something else, party. You know, someone said, oh, he's the Republican. Yes, I am a Republican. That said, I'm not seeking the endorsement of any party in this race because I want to call it like I see it. I think we have a remarkable once in a generation opportunity at this nonpartisan municipal level election to talk about solutions. How do we create more jobs? How do we keep our kids safe on the streets? What do we want our city to look like in 10, 20 years? And so that's why intentionally I've been reaching across the aisle. I have a DFL campaign treasurer and a DFL wife for that matter, so I have plenty of experience compromising with a DFLer. And I'd ask for your interest and your support as we go forward in this race. And how would you distinguish yourself or differentiate yourself? What would you do differently from the current mayor? That's the question, yeah. Sure. I have a lot of respect for R.T. Rybeck. I think he was, he's done a lot of good work, but I would distinguish myself in that I think R.T. Ryback and the current city council too often has prioritized the bells and whistles over the basic functions of city government. They've prioritized things that are nice to have over things that we need to have. You know, we all agree we need a robust, vibrant transit system, but with great respect, I'd submit that spending money on a streetcar system 
rather than enhancing our current bus system is the wrong choice. Streetcars are neat, but buses, by having heated bus stops and digital signs telling you when the next bus is going to come, buses get to the same place at much less cost. And so the streetcar is one example of how I disagree with Mayor Rybeck. Thank you. Gary Schiff, uh, how do you distinguish yourself from the other candidates here? And what would you do differently from the current mayor? Well, before I was elected to the city council, I was a community organizer, somebody who worked in coalition to pass two charter amendments, one to close civil rights loopholes, the other one to give people the right to vote when large corporate welfare packages are being approved by the city council. The, that experience helped me in office to represent a very diverse ward. My ward has the highest American Indian population in the city, the highest concentration of Latino-owned businesses, a historic African-American community. My ward is 50% people of color, 50% renters. And that experience on the city council has given me the ability to learn, to listen, to build coalitions so I can work with communities to advance a common agenda on what we agree on. I think public policy and public service is about making progress. This is the most progressive city in America, and I believe every neighborhood should make progress. Thank you. Uh, did you distinguish yourself between uh, the current mayor? Did you want to speak to that? Sure. I would have made sure that the Viking Stadium was paid for by progressive user fees so that it's the personal seat licenses, it's a ticket tax, it's sports memorabilia tax. I would not have supported doubling the footprint of the Metrodome to make it tax exempt and making every child in the audience who buys a candy bar chip in a few pennies for the new stadium because sales taxes are highly regressive. Jackie Cherry Holmes, thank you. What distinguishes you from your competitors, and uh, what would you do differently from the current mayor? You know, everybody's answer here is kind of like a little, we're pretty satisfied with the way things are. The recovery has come, and it's getting our way, and everything is getting better. You know, it's kind of like we just need to tinker around the edges to improve things a little bit. I'm not interested in that. I don't tinker around the edges. I'm going for major change. The fact of the matter is the recovery is not affecting everybody very well. We are not recovering as a city. We have gross disparities in health. We have gross disparities in economics. We have gross disparities in housing opportunities. That's our reality. I'm not interested in tinkering around the edges. I'm interested in change. I have the ability to do that. I know how to bring people together. I have relationships that are wide and deep and long and extend across this city. I have relationships everywhere in this city. I know how to bring people together. I work hard. I listen to people, and I work with them to solve problems. I'm not coming at this with a, I know exactly what's going to solve every problem. I want to listen to the citizens of our city. I want to engage and value our residents and put their valuable insights into any solutions we come up with together. This has to be a partnership. We're not going to tinker around the edges. We're going to make big change. And so is there something that you would have done differently from the present mayor? Is there some significant thing that would uh, have been done differently than you or than the present mayor? I will work intentionally with community members. I will not come out and say what I think is going to happen or what I think is best. I am deeply rooted in this community, and I'm interested in hearing what folks have to say and building partnerships and valuing everybody's opinion. This is not a top-down sort of deal for me. This is a bottom-up sort of deal. And that's not the way things have been operating. Things have been top-down with folks telling us what's good for us and what they think should happen. It's time that we engage our citizens, listen to them, and hear what they think should happen. Thank you. Mark Andrew, uh, what distinguishes you from your competitors, and what uh, would you have done differently from the present mayor? The mayor, the competitor, the city, or my competitors. What distinguishes you from your competitors? Thank you. On this panel, um, I've never been on the city council, but I have more government experience than any person sitting at this table, 
having been elected five times to the Hennepin County Board of Commissioners. I have more significant leadership experience than anybody on this panel. I was chairman of the Minnesota Democratic Party. I was chairman of the Hennepin County Board of Commissioners. I've chaired major nonprofits in the community. I have experience that nobody else has. I also have been blessed with the gift of quitting elected office and going into the private sector where I've held a job for the last 14 years and for the last seven and a half years have owned a green marketing company, Greenmark, which has delivered uh, not only employment opportunities but made our city greener. I also own food stands at the State Fair. I've employed 2,000 summer jobs uh, in, during my time out there and I'm hiring folks so you come see me if you want your kids to work this year. And, um, and finally, uh, I've got a long record of accomplishment, light rail transit, recycling, Midtown Greenway, child care increases, youth coordinating board, and Hennepin County Medical Center programs. Time is up, thank you. Give them all a round of applause. <clears throat> and so, uh, did you want to make a statement distinguishing you from the present mayor? 10 seconds. Well, the most glaring difference between me and the present mayor is that I wear matching socks <laughs> and I will continue my pledge to the people of the city is I will continue to do that. Um, I give the mayor um, high marks. He's done a good job. He had a rocky start. I was a strong Sharon person. I was a strong Peter McLaughlin person. He's done a really good job. But I think where I'm going to be different uh, is that I have a really big vision and the times require a really big vision. Thank you. Thank you. Give them all a round of applause. So we're going to spend the next uh, 20 minutes until we close uh, with questions from the audience. Uh, Reverend Stadden is here and he'll recognize, I see two people on the side here. Thank you, Al, for hosting um, this and thank you, Reverend McAfee, for opening his church. Um, how do you think ranked choice voting will affect the mayor's race this year? Let's start with uh, Mark Andrew. Um, thank you. Hi, Kim. Um, this, this thing is brand new. And I got to tell you, it's really different for me because I am not used to running for second place in my life. And every campaign I've run, I've run to win. I'm running to win this campaign, my sixth. But um, I think ranked choice voting is going to have an impact uh, on the race because it's forcing the candidates, I think, to deal with each other in a less personal way, in a more collegial way, even though there are differences. Uh, and I think that's going to um, I think that's going to have an impact on on the election. The way we navigate that and the way we do that will have an impact on the outcome. Don Samuels, uh, ranked choice voting. What's your thoughts about it? Yeah, ditto on uh, Mark's observations. I think uh, it's making us all a little bit nicer to each other. And um, it, it's also going to have an impact on the endorsement process. I think it kind of is counter to the endorsement process or the need for an endorsement because it's, it's, it's a self-endorsing kind of a process. And so I think it might render the process uh, uh, a little more dim in the, in the elections. Thank you. Um, ranked choice voting is going to change the way that we campaign, I hope. First, I think it'll make it more positive. If I want to be the second choice of any of my opponent's supporters, I don't want to alienate the supporters of any of my opponents. So I hope that it'll make it more positive. But what I do know is that we can leave no vote unturned. And the advantage for every community is that we all as candidates have to go to every community because we can leave no second choice vote, no third choice vote, no fourth choice vote unturned. That's why I supported ranked choice voting. I will be clear, I am asking every single one of you today for your first choice vote. Cam Winton. Cam Winton, sorry. Cam Winton, sorry. I agree with what's been said that it certainly changes the way that candidates interact. Mr. Samuel said that, you know, we're being friendlier to each other. I'm mowing Betsy's lawn later today. Gary, I think I'm doing your windows tomorrow morning, right? No, we're, we are building, I'd go as so far as say friendships across 
the candidates as we go forward, but more importantly, it gives voters an opportunity to step out of normal patterns. You can go to the booth and say, yeah, I really do support my number one person, but you know, I'm gonna think differently for number two. I'm gonna think broadly, and so I do ask yes for your first choice vote, and if I can't earn your first choice vote, I'd like to earn your second choice vote. Thank you very much. Gary Schiff. Ranked choice voting will strengthen the role of the DFL party. I'm the only candidate who's pledging to abide by the DFL endorsement because I believe in the DFL and I believe as progressives we are stronger when we stick together. And so in November there may be five candidates on the ballot, but only one has the opportunity to carry the label DFL endorsed. I'm running for the DFL endorsement because I believe that our party best works together in coalition and is the best party that represents progress for our neighborhoods, every neighborhood in Minneapolis. Thank you. Jackie Cherry Holmes. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say I didn't support ranked choice voting in the first place, but it's the system we're working with and we're going to figure out how to make it work. I think the, the notion that we're all being nicer to each other because we're in ranked choice voting is a little maybe not quite how it is, we're nice to each other because frankly five of us have been friends and colleagues for a very, very, very long time. I don't think we would be rude to each other anyways. This does provide an opportunity for us to uh, campaign around the city. Every person's vote counts equally with every other person's vote, but that also means then that we have an added responsibility to ensure that everyone in our city understands how this system works. And that responsibility is on us, too. We need to explain to everybody how this works and ensure everybody's participation. That's up to us. Uh, thank you, uh, Al Flowers. Uh, four years ago, I ran for mayor because I didn't think African Americans had a uh, choice uh, in the election. And uh, this year, I think we do have a choice. And, and uh, so I want to uh, say my question is, is about uh, uh, equity and diversity within the cabinet in City Hall. We, we've got a civil rights department that do not uh, with contract compliance. We've, we've been over many studies that haven't happened. They come back with studies saying it, it haven't happened, and then we still get nothing after you come back with the study. I'm wondering uh, from these uh, candidates, uh, what, uh, what can you tell us that we will be involved in government and I want to say that because we have, now we are over at the legislature, thanks to Senator Hayden, Senator Champion, and uh, Representative Mullery putting in legislation from the African American community. We got bills there. How can we get help uh, from the city? How is the city going to help and make sure we are part of the uh, city council? Thank you. Thank you. I, the question as I hear it is how do we support leadership of color in the city of Minneapolis? And I am proud to have done so already. Uh, I know that it's important not only to get leadership of color at the city, but to support them once they're there. Because sometimes that is the biggest challenge that we have. And I know that when Chief Jackson was under fire, I stood next to him, and I made sure that that situation went better than it would have otherwise. But the question is, am I dedicated to making sure that we have leaders of color in the city of Minneapolis? And the answer is yes. Um. Well, my staff reflects my intentions, and my staff has always been diverse, and uh, probably more so than anybody else's, and you will see that reflected in the future. I think this is an important thing to make a public commitment to. Uh, when I was chairman of the county board, I helped lead the recruitment of a, a person of color to be the Hennepin County Administrator and uh, we uh, worked on that because we coordinated uh, our efforts. We did the right research to make sure we had the talent linked to the job. Uh, then we did an act of recruitment, and then we developed a policy that would promote the retention uh, of um, employees of color. We can do the same thing and should do the same thing at the city. Jackie? 
I am honored to have served uh, with Sharon Sales Belton and in the administration of Sharon Sales Belton, who is uh, supporting me. And at that time, we had an African American city attorney. We hired an African American woman as the head of the Public Housing Authority, and we had African Americans in a number of leadership roles in the city. That will continue with me, but more importantly, I will partner with His Works United and the churches. I will partner with the community-based organizations who I already have relationships with. Uh, I don't need to be invited out to His Works United. I've been out there a number of times and met with the ministers. Everybody will be a partner with me. It's an open-door policy. I will work with the community to ensure that we have leadership in, in all levels of my administration. Gary Schiff. My first hire in City Hall was a voice from the community, a voice uh, very, very strong today at the Capitol, uh, Senator Jeff Hayden. And I think the question is not just about staffing and city hall and department heads, but it's about community representation, making sure that we have diverse community boards that provide input into city policy, and making sure that as mayor, I will meet with each of those community boards. I will go out to the community and meet with neighborhood organizations to make sure that I'm not just stuck in city hall in a bubble, but I'm out there in the community listening to you. And uh, Cam. Yeah, the, the topic of hiring and, and the topic of minorities has a, a special resonance for me because it was actually, it happened to be a minority who hired me to move to Minneapolis. B. Todd Jones, the current U.S. attorney, he interviewed me for my job at a law firm. He was a stern son of a gun. I was terrified. And I managed to say the right things, and so I got the job. And so in my hiring as I've gone forward on my campaign staff, you know, what's the first position I hired for as an elected official wannabe? Well, my campaign treasurer, and my campaign treasurer is former DFL-endorsed person of color, Ashwin Medea, who ran for Congress in the 3rd Congressional District. We need a city government that looks like our city, and when I'm mayor, we will. Thank you for all of the questions. So let me close uh, by asking each of the candidates then to do a summation, a closing, but you get the drift the sense of concerns of people in this community. Those are great questions, great expressions of our concerns. And I'd like you to, in a feeling way, uh, address those concerns in your closing 90-second remark. I think we'll start at the other end with uh, Cam Wenton. Cam, 90 seconds. Sure. I don't know that any leader could address all of those issues in 90 seconds, but I'll certainly try to speak from the heart to tell you who I am and why I'm running and capture as many of them as I could. Again, I'm Cam Winton. And throughout the course of this campaign, I ask you to support me in my effort to bring a fresh set of eyes to City Hall, to build on all that's good about our city, but work to fix the things that aren't. Let me tackle a few of the things that were mentioned. Our educational system. I'm the proud graduate of public schools. From kindergarten through 12th grade, I went to public school. And on the basis of that education, I was able to go off and get degrees from, from three world-class universities. I'm tremendously grateful to the public school teachers who helped me do that. But too many of our public school children are not getting the education they need right now. And as mayor, I want to do more to shake things up. We need longer school days and longer school years. We need principals to be able to decide whom to hire and whom to fire in their schools. We need to link pay to performance. We need to use data. We need to end last in, first out. And as mayor, I don't just want to use the bully pulpit to try to make that happen. I want four direct appointments to the school board to try to push through these changes so that all children can have the opportunities that I was fortunate enough to have as a child. Let me also say that throughout my life, I have been an advocate for people who needed advocacy. When a woman was injured in the bridge collapse, or when my company had its back to the wall and some of our employees were threatened with losing their jobs, I went to bat for those folks, and I won both times and plenty of others. I want to go to bat for our city and for those who need somebody going to bat for them. And so I ask you to consider me for your first choice vote, Cam Winton. Thank you. Thank you, Cam. Betsy Hodges? Well, this has been an extraordinary conversation today, reflecting a community. And it isn't that different from the other conversations I've had, that we in the city of Minneapolis are looking to be a prosperous and unified city that works. A city that works does have police accountability. It does make sure that our workforce reflects the people of the city. One thing I've done recently 
is, is work with Achieve Minneapolis and our NCR department to make sure that step-up graduates were recruited to be members of our boards and commissions. Young, vibrant, diverse group of kids who can make a big difference in the city. That's a city that works. A prosperous city makes sure that we create jobs, that we have the transportation to get people to and from those jobs, and that we have the housing for those employees to live in, and that we're providing reasons for business to invest here. A prospering city also has an excellent education system, and the city needs to partner with the schools to make sure that that happens. But the one thing we need to make sure to do for this city, if we're going to become the greatest city of the 21st century, is we need to create unity, which means knowing that the things we do to prosper are things that we need to do for every part of our community. I'm running for mayor because I wanted to make sure every single person in our city can benefit from the opportunities that we have to build the relationships to make that happen so that we can become the greatest city of the 21st century. Thank you. Don, Don Samuels. Thank you, Al, and thank you, uh, child, uh, New Salem, and uh, for this wonderful welcome and uh, hosting. I'm running for mayor after a lifetime of working in the private sector. In spite of people talking about the private sector, I've worked in the private sector longer than anybody at this podium. And uh, at age 53, I finally went into politics. I didn't go in because I was always had a dream of being a politician. I went in because my neighbors asked me to, and I resisted it. But they saw the changes we were able to make working together in the community for our children, so that an, a senior citizen need not be afraid to walk down the block, and a child need not be afraid to stand at the bus stop. They knew, my, when Bill, my friend across the street, asked me to run, he said, we have 50 kids in our after-school program, and we think two of them might graduate. He said, Don, you have to run. They don't understand what's happening. That's why I'm here. This is the opportunity of my lifetime to make a difference for our children so that they graduate from high school, college ready. Now, when I go to Harvest Prep, and I go to the schools around here, Nellie Stone, and I see the African-American children in the audience, I see successful, prosperous husbands and wives working good jobs, getting good pay, and contributing and paying taxes to a thriving city. That's what I see. I can see it. I can taste it, and I will never rest until that is achieved as mayor of the city of Minneapolis, working with the school board for our children. Thank you. Thank you. Mark Andrew. Thank you very much. I am more prepared to be mayor today than at any other point in my career. Yes, I had a great career in public service with a great record, and I'm proud of that. And I had a, I've had a great record in private business as an employer greening our city and moving our city forward. But I think I'm prepared to be mayor because of the tapestry of my life experiences in this community as an innovator, as a student, as an organizer, as an employer, as a father, as a husband, as a customer, and as a neighbor. These experiences have given me the temperament and the courage to do the three things that a mayor has to do. First, a mayor has to have a big, bold vision to move our city forward. Two, the mayor has to have the ability to pull entire communities together, not just small groups, but entire communities together so that we can propel our city forward in common cause with a common agenda. And finally, and maybe most important, I am the only person up here who has a demonstrative history of having the guts and the courage to stand up and lay my cards on the table and tell people we're going to spend, we're going to invest, we're going to build transit, we're going to build housing, we're going to build jobs, we're going to green the north side of Minneapolis and the rest of the city too. 
Those are the ingredients that a mayor has to have, and I am proud that I was given those gifts. Thank you. Thank you. Jackie Cherry Holmes. I want to circle back to the questions that, that people were asking, and I think there were some themes there. There was a theme about education. There was a theme about police. There was a theme about the criminal justice system and a theme about jobs. Those are things I've heard about in this community for years. Those are things that I am prepared to tackle. But you don't tackle them alone, you tackle them in partnership with people. I've worked in our neighborhoods in both North and South Minneapolis, and I've dealt with some of these most challenging issues facing, facing us. I've listened, I've organized, and I've solved problems. I work hard, I'm tenacious, I have relationships throughout our city, and I'm passionate about Minneapolis's future, and I have a track record. I'm a grassroots person, and this is a grassroots campaign. The next mayor must be someone who has relationships throughout the city. I have those relationships. The next, next mayor shouldn't be someone who tells us what to do. The next mayor should be prepared to listen. I'm a good listener. The next mayor must have the vision, the strength, and the ability to bring us all together, where everyone is valued and everyone has opportunity. I know how to do that. I've done it before. I'm prepared to do it again. As mayor, with your support, I will hit the ground running. Team Cherry Homes is a big tent. We got all kinds of people in the big tent. I ask everyone to join us in the big tent and together, together we will build a city that works for each and every one of us. Thank you, Gary Schiff. For 12 years on the city council, I've been a progressive, clear, consistent voice for our values. Uh, I'm the son of a public school teacher. I believe in education, and I believe in the value of hard work. And as mayor, I will support our schools, not by attacking or criticizing, but by bringing resources so that our children can have the same opportunities that children in schools 20 miles away have today. I'll be a mayor who works to make sure that urban planning is something that happens with the community, not to the community. I'll be a mayor who makes sure that we disrupt the cycle of poverty with early childhood investment and make sure that we recognize our elders as a resource, as some population that's growing and should be treasured and needs to be housed. Our senior population needs housing that we don't have today. And by building that housing, we can put people to work. I'll be a mayor who demands accountability for our contractors to make sure that they are hiring people who live in our city. I'll be a mayor who increases home ownership, increases affordable housing opportunities, increases job opportunities, because I believe we can be a city where it doesn't take two jobs to raise one child. I believe we can be the city known where it's easy to get a job, not a gun. And I believe that in the most progressive city in America, Minneapolis can be the city where every neighborhood makes progress. Thank you. Thank you, Gary Schiff. Well, thank all of these candidates. Uh, give them all a round of applause. That was a great uh, presentation, great answers. Before we close, I want two things to happen. One, I want to have a, a brief remark from State Senator Bobby Joe Champion. We're in his house. Uh, Bobby Joe. Come on up. And then after Bobby Joe Champion, we'll close with uh, some marching orders from the organizer of this event. The organizer of this event on behalf of the Minnesota State Baptist Convention and his Works United and Inside News is Pastor Brian Heron from Zion Baptist Church. Thanks to Pastor Heron. And Pastor, will you come and close us out after the Senator speaks? Thank you so very much. How are you? Also, remember that caucuses are coming up, especially for the DFL party. I know it's, it's April 16th, and then there are different times for conventions, so make sure that you are um, uh, engaged and knowledgeable of that. The last thing that I'll say is that our government must, re must really represent we the people. 
And the only way that our government can represent we the people is if you make sure that your voice is being heard. And the world is run by those who show up. So we want to make sure that you show up and be counted and your voice to be heard. Thank you so very much, and I look forward to being with you on the campaign trail. And now, Reverend Heron. First, I want to thank everyone for coming out. Uh, this is such an important and crucial time for our community. And, and we must have a sense of urgency uh, about what's going on in our community. We are not faring well in every area. The, the reports are out. And, they, and, and the thing about it is I went back 50 years ago, it was the same disparities. They've only gotten worse. So this isn't even new, but it's getting worse. Nobody's going to do anything until we do something. Amen. The message today is that we will no longer be silent. We will no longer sit silent. We will hold you accountable for the things that you say. We will go to the polls and vote, but we're going to be informed voters now. We're not just going to the polls just to cast a vote, but we're going to be informed voters, which means that now we got some work to do. Now we need to see who's really going to do what they say they're going to do. Now we need to begin to, uh, I, I, I want to thank Insight News, I want to thank His Works United, I want to thank President McAfee from the State Baptist for allowing this opportunity, but we got more work now, y'all, because now we got to hold forums about ranked choice voting so that our community understands what ranked choice voting is so that we can get it done and we can do it right. Uh, we, we need to hold more forums for the fifth ward candidate, uh, the city council, and, for, uh, and whenever the county commissioner comes up, we need to be on that too. This isn't the last time you're going to see us. It's not the last time you're going to hear from us. When you get elected to office, we're going to be there. Uh, this, this, this is, this is a new day in the city of Minneapolis for the African-American community. And it is us pastors uh, who have come together with the press and, and, and with others to say that we must rise to a higher level in our community. Now, having said all that and speaking truth to powers that be, we also have to speak truth to ourselves. Which means that if we begin to get changes, then we have to be prepared for those changes and we can't keep acting the same way we acted. It means that we have to rise as a community to a higher form of ourselves. It means that we have to come back to the dignity and, and the respect that we, that is our heritage. Now, I want to thank you for coming. I, I really do. I, I, I thank you for coming. I, I thank you for uh, uh, your uh, candid uh, as you sit here today, um, and I want you to know that uh, whoever is elected mayor, we're going to look for you to do exactly what you said you would do. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We got to say good night. We want to thank Alan McFarland for bringing us all those great words and all our lovely guests, all the guests in the house. Everything's good, you know. So I want y'all to tune in every Tuesday morning, right around 9 o'clock. Because we're going to play your song. All the guests will be home. We'll be feeling like talking. Have a robust conversation.